Noam Chomsky is an American linguist, philosopher, cognitive scientist, historian, social critic, and political activist. Sometimes called the father of modern linguistics, Chomsky is also a major figure in analytical philosophy and one of the founders of the field of cognitive science. He holds a joint appointment as institute professor emeritus at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology which is known as the MIT and the laureate professor at the University of Arizona and he is the author of more than 100 books on topics such as the linguistics, law, politics and mass media. Ideologically he aligns with the anarcho-syndicalism and libertarian socialism. It has been 50 years since Noam Chomsky first became the major public figure in the United States after publishing his essay, The Responsibility of Intellectuals, which is given that the American academies have failed in their core duty to responsibility in querying to truth over the past five decades. He has paradoxically been both one of the most well-known and influential thinkers in the world and almost completely absent from mainstream U.S. media. Now here I am going to highlight some of his analytical, some of his analytical ideas in the different film. Firstly I will talk about the Libertarian Socialism. In the United States, Libertarianism is associated with the right of socialism, with the left, the Libertarian value, freedom, or what are they called freedom, while the socialist value equality, and uh, many people accept his distinctions as a fear after all the right wants more government while the left wants a big redistributionist government even many leftists implicitly accept this freedom versus equality distinction is fear suggesting that while freedom may be nice fairness is more important Libertarian Socialism, the political tradition in which Noam Chomsky operates, which is closely tied to anarchism, rejects the distinctions as illusory. If the word libertarianism is taken to mean a belief in freedom, and the word socialism is taken to mean a belief in Fairness, then the two are not just not opposite, but they are necessarily complements. They are necessarily complements. That is because if you have freedom from the government intervention, but you don't have a fair economy, your freedom become meaningless in that case. Because you will still be faced with the choice between the working and starving, meaningful to the extent that it actually creates a capacity for you to act. If you are poor, you don't have much of an actual capacity to do much. So you are not terribly free. Likewise, socialism without a conception of freedom is not actually fair and equal. Libertarian socialists have always been critical of Marxist steps because the libertarian socialists recognizes the equality enforced by a brutal and repressive state is not just unfree but is an unequal because there is a huge 
imbalance of power between the people and the state. The Soviet Union was obviously not free, but it was also not socialist, because the people don't actually control anything, the state did. The libertarian socialist perspective is well captured by a quote from the pioneer anarchist Mikhail Bakunin, liberty without socialism is privilege and injustice. Socialism without liberty is slavery and brutality. During the 1860s and 70s, 50 years before the Soviet Union, Bakunin warned that Marxist socialism's authoritarian current would lead to hideous repressions in a Marxist regime. He said there will be a new class, a new hierarchy of real and pretended scientists and scholars and the world will be divided into majority ruling in the name of knowledge and an immense ignorant majority. And then all betide the mass of ignorant ones. You can see quite well that behind all the democratic and socialistic phrases and promises of Marxist program there is to be found in the state all that constitutes the true despotic and brutal nature of all the states. This as we know is precisely what happened unfortunately however the bloody history of 20th century of the Marxism, Leninism has convinced many people that socialism itself is discredited. The means of the voices of the people in the libertarian socialist traditions like Bakunin, Peter Kriopotanik, Noam Chomsky, who have always stood for a kind of socialism that places a core value on freedom and developer authoritarianism in it emphasizes to democracy that the people should get to participate in the decisions that affect their life. However, those decisions are labeled political or economic. It deters the capitalism because the capitalist institutions are totalitarian. You don't get to vote for who your boss is. And you get a very little to say in what your company does. But it also believes strongly in freedom of expression and civil liberties. Libertarian socialism sends to me a beautiful philosophy. It rejects the both the misery to economic exploitations and the misery to the Stalinist totalitarianism, arguing that the problem it misery itself, however, the source it is a very simple concept, but it's easy to miss because of the binary that pits communism against capitalism. Thus, if you are a critic of the capitalism, you must be an apologist for the most brutal socialist governments, but every time there has been such government, Libertarian socialist criticizer have been critics have been the first to call it our for its hypocrisy. Usually such people are the first one liquidated, but the libertarian traditions in socialism is precious and Chomsky skeptical of the Corporate and government power alike in our for most public exponent of it. Now in the secondly, now secondly, pragmatic, pragmatic utopianism. The problem with utopianism is that they are not practical and the problem with the pragmatists is that 
they often lack a vision if you dream of elaborate perfect ah societies but you don't remain anchored in real world realities and have a sense of how to get things done all of your dreams are useless and you may even end up destroying the progress ah you have already made for the sake of an ideal you will never reach but you have but if you don't have a strong sense of what and the ultimate long run goal is you not ah going to know whether you are moving closer to it or not chance ke approach is to the political reality sense to me a good balance of the both radical reason and pragmatic he is an anarchist in his strong skepticism of authority and an utopian in the belief that the that the ideal world is a world without the social classes or just hierarchies of any kind world without war or economic deprivations but he is also deeply conscious of the realities of the world we live in and the need for the and the need for those who care about moving towards these utopia to be willing to take small steps rather than just to wait for the revolution consider chemsky's approaches to voting chemsky believes simultaneously that firstly voting is not a very important part of politics because it does not change much thanks to the combination of the typical awful candidates and the low impact of a single vote secondly you should still vote and if you live in swing state you should vote for the democratic candidate for president he is radical in that he believe we need for border political actions than simple voting once every few year for the last votes to to measure party candidate but practical in that he also believes that it's better if democrats get into office than republicans chemsky understands that you can simultaneously work to say obama care and believe that it's a pitiful attitude for a genuine health care guarantee and we need much more radical changes thirdly rejecting simple binary distinctions both of the above examples are the part of the tendencies of chemsky's thought that have consistently found how for trying not to fall into simply binary distinctions so if the question is do you support the democrats or do you believe in third parties the chemsky's answer is roughly it depends on the circumstances if a third party whose principles are the closer to mine then the democrats had a viable changes of winning i would vote third party if the only thing the third party is likely to do is split the progress of vote and put the republican in a fish i would hold my nose and vote for democrat or in the question is should we be reformist or revolutionist chemsky's answer is well it depends what each of those would entail let's talk about what we mean by each of those terms and which one is likely to get us to our goal you can see this tendency at work in noam chomsky's attitude towards the boycott the movement and sanctions movement against israel chomsky 
is known as a critique of Ireland, but he has received the criticism from BDS, Divestment and Sanctions members, for questioning the efficacy of their tactics. This has related to suggestions that Chomsky opposes BDS in the world of why? You have to either support something or oppose the idea of supporting the goal of improving the welfare of Palestinians and the tactics and the tactics of backwards, but opposing particular actions by the various movement does not fit within the existing binary. Likewise, Chasky has been accused of rejecting the comparison of the Israel treatment of the Palestinians with apartheid South Africa with a critic saying that dismisses the apartheid designations. In fact, what he has tried to do is draw a distinction. In Israel itself, racial division is not on the level with the South African apartheid but in the occupied territories, it actually owes than apartheid, but to some supporters of BDS theory that the situation within the Israel is not as brutal as apartheid will mean Chomsky is dismissing an apartheid comparison. Even though he actually thinks this situation for many Palestinians is also than apathetic. The norms can be difficult to appreciate unless we set aside our existing binary classifications. Fourthly, the consistent application of moral standard. One of Chomsky's simplest principle is almost the most difficult to apply in practice. You should judge yourself by the same moral standard that you judge other by this has formed the core of this critic of US foreign policy. And yet it is often sufficiently appreciated even by those that embraces his conclusions. Many people think that Chomsky is uniquely anti American. In fact his criticisms <coughs> in fact his criticisms of the inner states are so strong largely because when this elementary moral principle is applied to the fact, the conclusion is inevitably deeply damning. It simply turns out that if you judge the United States by the standard that it uses to judge other people, the United States does not look very good. If you take the fact of, say, the United States bombing of laws, one of states secretly dropping 2.5 million tons of bombs in 60s and 70s, massacring the many thousands of the peaceable villages, 20,000 of whom were killed or in jail, in the decades of the bombing when unexploded bombs went up. You imagine how it would appear to us if the role had been reversed, how had been bombing the United States. You begin to see just how inconsistent we are in our evaluations of our own actions and versus the actions of the others. Five black people died in the Iraq war. If the Iraq had evaded the United States and five black people died, actually the proportional population equivalent would be closer to five black would derive by any way, anybody in the country could conceive of Iraq as a force for good. In the world, in the way that the U.S. believe people should think we are, it's nothing. If Vietnam had evaded the United States, the way the United States had evaded Vietnam, would such an act ever be considered justified? 
This idea of the moral consistency of trying to treat like behavior alike is the simplest possible notion in the world. It's so elementary that it sounds childish to even pose the questions. And yet the power of the Latin patriotic, Latin patriotic sentiment is so great that it makes a clear right and fearless man incredibly difficult. It's hard to see the world through other people's eyes. To see what our self-justification to self-justification look like to those who are on the receiving end of our action. And when we do it, it's deeply discomforting. But this is the foundation of Chomsky's critique. It's not enough to have values. Terrorism is bad. You must apply those values consistently. That is, if something would constitute terrorism, if done against us, it must constitute terrorism. If it is done by us, Chomsky is seen as being anti-American for pointing out that if the Nuremberg principles were applied consistently, essentially every post where United States president would have to be hanged. But this is just a result of the applications of consistencies. The crime of aggressive war that was so forcefully contained the Nuremberg has been committed repeatedly by the In both linguistics and politics, Chomsky often uses his famous Martin coming to art. Example, try to imagine what our planetary affairs would look like to someone who was not the part of one of the particular human society, but was separate from them and able to see their communities, they would perceive the similarities between human languages rather than the difference and they would see the visory ways in which each country perceives its own acts as right and every else as wrong. Even when the same act are being committed, the principle of treating all human being consistently has an incredible power to eliminate because it have asked clearly what our value actually are and make sure we are following them but it also helps us become too ununiversitized in the sense that we can bring to few things from a human perspective rather than the nationalistic perspective. Now, the fairly clear and accessible writing. Even though Noam Chomsky is not exactly known for the memorability or emotional force of his prose, he helped to teach us to write. That's because he writes and speaks in a very particular way, in a clear language, maximally designed for the people to actually be able to understand it. Chansky is one of the few writers on the left who entirely sounds highly abstract, theoretically lingo, in favor of the straightforward plain languages, argumentations, in his political writing, he follows the principle which I share that it is the writer's job to make himself understood rather than the reader's job to try to figure out what the hell the writer is talking about. The actual follows from Chomsky's liberal socialist politics. The great libertarian socialists have generally been Creditably clear writer, comparing our experiences of reading Rudolf Rock's nationalism and culture with the experiences of reading Louis 
Australia. This is particular because they have a strong belief in democratic education. They believe that every people should have access to knowledge and understanding. And that intellectual endeavor should not be the purview of a specialized caste of privileged people. They believe that ordinary workers should get to read the classics and understand the science and the mathematics because they do not believe in the social class and hierarchy. The libertarian socialists have always been critical of the moral Leninist mindset which sees the social changes coming from a vanguard and intellectuals who know what's the best for the people, for the anarchist socialists, the power to change their lives and should be in the people's own hand. This writing even on the complicated subject should be in as clear language as possible because it's not just to be available to academies and people who have had elite educations. Just to follow this principle true in a number of respects. Throughout his life, he has preferred to give talks to small activists, churches groups, community organizers, rather than the students at Ivy language schools, but because he believes the latter are less likely to listen anything. His writings can be complex and sometimes requires a lot of patience and mental efforts, but they are never intensely difficult and their meanings are always clear, unlike many academies who bury their points in lawyer of speciality German. Chemsky believes the job of a writer is to communicate the point and to do so successfully. Now sixthly, spectacism of status. This one is a particularly important one for all. This one is a particularly important for all of us. Chesky's principle is that you must examine the quality of the ideas themselves and rather than the credentials of those voicing them. This sounds is enough but it's in life we are constantly expected to differ to the superior wisdom of the people who have superior status but whom we are pretty sure don't know what they are talking about. There is always a little part of us that goes, well I know it sounds like he does not know what he is talking about. But he is my professor priest superior so perhaps I am just a stupid. Chansky talks a lot about the way social status and the privileges are generated, rewards and accolades often fail to people not on the basis of their superior knowledge but on the basis of their ability to convince people that they have superior knowledge which is according different thing in theory. People at the top often try to convince those at the bottom that you get to the top by being small. In fact, Chomsky says, success is probably driven by the possession of some combinations of greed, cynicism, of sequenceness and subordinations, lack of courtesy and independence of mind, self-serving disregards for others, and who knows what else. Education, he says, slate for the passivity. You do well if you flatter your teachers by repeating what they think. You do less well if you refuse to go along with the assignments you were given because you think they are stupid. So to say the education systems in the US, Chansky suggests, 
does not really educate, it subdues. A genuine education involves helping someone through a process of self-discovery or curiosity, not just learning to regularly facts. This is because the people who do best in our current education systems are those who get the most, as opposed to those who developed their minds the most. We should not trust a person to be wise just because they are educated. This is something a lot of people realize institutively, but there are still a lot of educated fools who are listened to and given a lot of credences. But what I love about Chansky is that this is not an embrace the ignorance or anti-intellectualism. It's anti-intellectualism is that Chansky opposes the idea of having a secular priesthood of intellectuals who, who are a special class who are in the business of imposing thoughts, but it's not anti, it's not anti-intellectual. If the intellectual means the use of the mind, in fact, this is precisely what Chesky is encouraging. And it does not mean that you should not learn from experts. Rather, it means that you should try to critically evaluate what an expert says and to determine on your own whether to accept it or not. And that you should judge an expert by the ideas rather than near, mere curriculum with self-critical science. Nonchansky view of the correct way to do science is instructive. Many people on the left are critical of science or what they call scientism because they believe that it imposes some kind of rigid technocratic and enlightenment frameworks on how humans should think, suggesting that wisdom form of the regions are the superior than insistence on a kind of certainty about scientific belief that ignores different points of view. Inter many people in the sciences reinforce these conceptions and by defending and dogmatic conceptions of science. People like Sham Harris, Richard Dickens, and who use the mockery to defend what they call regional faults stereotypes about the scientist stereo scientific mindset that cannot see its ignorance due to its certainty of its own rational Chansky conception science is much more helpful and once again illustrates his ability to get beyond simple binaries you either accept scientific fact or you dismiss the scientific mentality. Chansky and to be fair, he is hardly alone in this. So to say, Chansky views science as uncertain rather than certain. The scientific approach to understanding the world is imposed to do the best you can given the limits of your reasons, the limits of your reasons. But far from being blind to those limits, they are themselves a central subject for scientific investigation. In fact, even though he is definitely a defender for the enlightenment of the traditions and so far, as he believed in using reasons and logic to solve problems, Chansky has voiced some of the most serious doubts of anyone in the science of the human being. Potential to fully understand the world Chansky encourages us to appreciate that because we are biological creature, our our capacities are very limited. Despite of our uni, we are more like pigs than like angels. And for us to 
achieve with him. Even a cheerful knowledge of the universe is not much different from a picnicking day could instantly. Much of Chomsky's work has been on how human beings innate their capacity structure, their thinking, and if that's your starting point, you will be skeptic about how much science can even hope to truly accomplish given the finite abilities of our brains and bodies. Chomsky divides scientific questions into questions which can potentially be solved and mysteries which may be beyond the limit of the human comprehensions. Consciousness and free will, for example, may be simply for example, may simply be mysterious that our biological limitations always prevent us from investigating deeply. Earthly, in respect of the commitment to open inquiry, because the libertarian socialist traditions has always so strongly valued freedom and deliberative democracy, it has a strong commitment to freedom of expression, unlike many forms of authoritarian socialism, which swiftly produces a justification for why certain forms of the reactionary speeches must be suppressed and for the good of the multitude, or because speech is power and power of authority, or any other justifications alike. Libertarian socialists generally believe very strongly in permitting all points of views and generally to spectacularly on efforts to respond to morally objectionable speech which censorship rather than with a more rational and persuasive speech. Now the Noam Chomsky commitment to radical free speech has landed to him in trouble before. Even with uh, other members of the left. Most uh, notoriously, he wrote in books of the free speech right of the Robert Persians, a French literature professor who had denied the existence of the Nazi gas chambers and called an Francis diary of forgery. Persian was dismissed from his positions repeatedly convicted in the French criminal court, and even which were beaten and sprayed with the strange gashes and Chomsky's was who has called the Holocaust. The most fantastic outburst of the collective insanity in human history wrote an essay defending Parisians' right to free speech and signed a petition drafted by the Fiorations, Holocaust, denying support to us and calling for him to be allowed to freely publish his findings and for the government to do anything possible to ensure safety and free exercise of his legal rights. Now the French intellectuals polarized Chomsky for his support of Fiorations and he has repeatedly been accused of being an apologist for Holocaust denial. Nightly, the power without conspiracy theory. Noam Chomsky is sometimes an accused of holding the smoke-filled room. View of the political everything is a burning conspiracy among the powerful to appraise the power race. In fact, this is precisely of the opposite of the Chomsky's view of conspiracy. The real view is, I think, or think of nuns, the belief that the oppression does not require a conspiracy. And that he smoke a filter room concept in its understanding how powerful work. Chomsky, in a consistent critique of the conspiracy theory, why? Because generally there does not need to be any kind of conspiracy to create kind of gross inequalities and cruelties we see in our society. Most of it is right out in the open. Furthermore, conspiracy theories over complicated. For example, in order to believe that the Bush did 
the conspiracy, you have to believe in an incredibly capable or competent government that was able to plan and execute an extraordinary destructive act without anyone leaking or blowing the whistle at any of the many levels it would have required to do such a thing. It requires a view of the government competence that is hard to maintain. A far simpler and more possible theory is simply that the Bush administration used the talk to the advantages and that it found them politically evident for carrying out its presenting plan to evade Iran. That does not require a kind of the conspiracy like was with the CIA. We know about many of the agencies found deaths. It's murder, coughs, tortures. Problem is not that. The information is hidden in darkness. It's nobody actually holds the agency accountable. Lastly, point 10. Lastly, point 10. Simple things are the most complicated thing. Chensky speaks frequently about how curiosity and the path to knowledge begin by doubting of the thing that seems most certain. As he says, willingness to be puzzled by what seems to be obvious too is the first step towards gaining understanding of how the world works. His investigations into language, which ended up revolutionizing linguistics, were driven by the desire to answer simple questions like, why is it that even young children are able to use language in so many different kinds of ways? It often turns out that the simplest questions are the ones that are the most difficult to answer or the one that people have over to or the one that people have overlooked because they assume they already know the answer. Chomsky's willingness to ask a very basic question and ask simple things has strongly affected many of the thinkers. It is easy to feel as if simple questions are stupid question. There is a fear of seeming childish. By saying or asking someone obvious, getting over that fear was tremendously used for someone. Because it enabled someone to approach the question that I felt were important, but that it seemed as if everyone must already know the answer to. For example, it has led someone to ask the thing like, why don't we talk about nuclear war more? Why are public school good? And are we talking about the climate changing is a useful way? I spent more time wondering about issues. I implicitly look for guaranteed like how I know what my values are and why I think the thing I think. I wonder why people say certain things or dress certain ways or believing certain things. This willingness to look at the things you take for guaranteed with a new kind of spectrum or puzzlement in an incredibly valuable tool and can make you both more curious and more humble. Nomo Chemsky was once asked which he enjoyed producing more, his linguist writing or his political writing. The question apparently took him by surprise. He did not know why anyone would think he enjoyed doing his political writing. He did it because he felt morally compelled to do it, not because it was pleasurable. Chansky's public persona appears somewhat 
completely. He is serious. He is often acidic in his tone. And he comes himself confidently to the point of arrogance to those like the Shanghais who have been on the receiving end of the Chomsky's somewhat merciless, rehotic and ideas of him as a nice person or seems strange. And yet, Noam Chomsky is a nice person or at last a person who is very kind and generous with his time. It's well known that Chomsky's response to nearly every person's to email and that's to any member to the public. The perceptions of Chomsky's as arrogant arises largely from the fact that he does not really care how he is perceived. In private, he is warm and generous, but in public he is stern and uncompromising debater. There is a kind of selfishness to him that one would never reason in another person. He depreciates his own achievements in linguistics. He does not care about the errors or prestigious fames. means nothing to him and he takes no real pride in his political war. Instead, if one asks him, he says he feels like a failure for not having been able to do more good with his life. The character aspects has been just as important as any intellectual lessons for anyone. And I always try to remind myself that I should be generous to strangers, to cultivate humility and should always focus on the work rather than on the rewards in my life. Thus, for the team, I think you have enjoyed this video as well the article. Thank you. Thank you very much.